Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Peru Trivedi, who's the Vice President for Corporate Relations at Meridian and a conversation with the Senior Minister of Health from Singapore. So Peru, over to you. Thank you very much. My name is Peru Trivedi and I am the Vice President of Corporate Affairs for the Meridian International Center, where I lead our Meridian Corporate Council. We're here with Dr. Janil Puttucheri uh, to talk about Singapore's use of technology in response to COVID-19 and other public health purposes. We are honored to be joined by the Honorable Senior Minister of State for Health and Minister of Communications and Information, along with being the government whip for the government of Singapore. Certainly very accomplished. Uh, among the many accomplishments of Dr. Puttucheri, he is also the minister in charge of the government technology agency, um, the Singapore government's in-house technology transformation agency, GovTech. And before joining politics, Dr. Puthucheri was a medical doctor. Dr. Puthucheri, minister, welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me. I, I, I would just want to point out that I still have my medical license. I'm not sure anybody would be comfortable being my patient, but. Technically, I'm also a, still a doctor as well as a politician. Technically. Excellent, Excellent sir. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And um, I thought we'd begin off with a couple of brass tacks here. So, uh, sir, we'd love to hear the current status uh, of the daily COVID-19 cases in Singapore right now uh, in your country. Well, um, this is the data is uh, as of the 13th of October. We've uh, had about 57,800 almost 890 cases. Um, we've uh, got a small number who have uh, uh, been fatalities, 0.1% uh, of all our COVID patients, so 28 unfortunate deaths. Uh, but almost all of our patients have uh, fully recovered. They've been discharged. Um, and so currently, our new cases in the community remain low, single digits, uh, zero for, for a day or two. Uh, and I think the key issue, though, is that even though we've still got a trickle uh, of cases. Uh, they've been linked cases. They, they've uh, really not been unlinked cases where we've not known the provenance of where they've received their infection from. Uh, so that, that demonstrates that our contact tracing, our public health efforts to try to get on top of this uh, remain robust. Um, and we have been able to open up. We have people who are coming to Singapore. Some of them are returnees. Uh, but also business people. And so, of course, that has with it a certain risk. But again, we detect the cases while they're within their stay home notice or within their quarantine, again, demonstrating that our public health measures um, are working. Uh, our low fatality rate, our low case numbers, we should be celebrating. Uh, I'm, I must say I did have a little bit of a, a smile on my face when I got that notification of zero cases for the day. But uh, we want to hold back that uh, that sense of celebration because resurgence and reignition of the pandemic clearly is possible. And the lessons from around the world are that that's uh, very easy, even in the best of circumstances, uh, to occur. A second wave of the virus, um, increased risks as we resume a broader range of activities. So we have adopted a very cautious approach for higher risk activities, especially those involving large numbers of people uh, interacting with each other in, in close spaces and basically taking the approach that our priority must be to prevent a super spreader event uh, and mitigate the risks of opening up, uh, accepting that there will be a handful of cases on a daily basis. Excellent, sir. Yes, we can certainly appreciate your thoughtful approach to this. Um, so Singapore was the first country to deploy a national coronavirus tracing app, Trace Together. Uh, I understand that it works uh, alongside another application called Safe Entry. Uh, would you share a bit more about the technology and how you're using it for contact tracing? Yeah, well, Trace Together is, uh, is, is an app, but it's also a program that we have. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an app, uh, a token, uh, a, a databasing program, and it integrates with what we're doing in, in our public health uh, space. And what the Trace Together program does is it uses Bluetooth technology essentially to develop a log of proximity, who have you been close to. 
Uh, so it's quite separate from our safe entry program, which is essentially a location-based check-in program. Um, and we put the two together as a resource for our contact tracing professionals to augment our public health efforts. And the um, metric that we use to ascertain the, the, the effectiveness of these two is really how quickly we can um, identify and quarantine the close contacts of COVID-19 positive patients by the public health professionals. And so using uh, the two of these tools, the, the two programs together with a variety of other technology uh, enhanced uh, 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 tools, we've got the time to identify and quarantine uh, patients, uh, I beg your pardon, contacts of patients down to under two days. And so that would be the metric that, that we've used to, to identify uh, the success of these uh, programs. It's an augmentation of our public health efforts and not a replacement. Uh, and that's how I'd frame it. Excellent. Yes, I understand that over 2 million people are currently using the app, which is incredible. Uh, and a great adoption rate. Um, yeah, I think that that only accounts for about 40% of the population. Is that enough for it to be effective? Well, um, it has already proven that it's effective. Uh, I mean, it's getting our, our speed of contact tracing all the way down under two days. Um, it's ad adding information to the public health professionals' uh, ability to identify what are the types of events, what are the locales, what are the behaviors that are at risk? So it's, it's, it's effective in that sense. But if it's going to be transformative uh, in terms of our contact tracing, moving from under two days to almost real time or you sort of getting it down to hours, indeed then we need to get the penetration rate, the participation rate past 70, 75%, and the higher the better. Um, but I would point out that this 40% adoption rate, this 2 million people, it's entirely voluntary. Uh, so it demonstrates the, the interest that Singaporeans have in engaging themselves in this program and the availability of uh, both the sort of infrastructure. The, you know, you have to have a confidence in your, in your mobile bandwidth as well as people having smartphones and being willing to download this uh, onto their smartphones. Um, but clearly it's not enough. Uh, so we want to close the gap, and get it past 70%. Um, that's why we've introduced the token. And the token is a little hardware Bob, it's a little device, it's a token, uh, and uh, it's about the same shape and size as, a, as, a, as an AirPod case, no endorsement from Apple, um, just to give you a frame of reference, uh, but it runs essentially the same software. And then what it means is those uh, citizens who don't want to have the app on their phone or who don't have a phone and prefer to use a hardware means of engaging with the program can do so. So we have designed the program as well as the software to be potentially 100% inclusive so that everybody in Singapore could benefit from inclusion. Uh, so the token and the app complement each other. Uh, we've started a nationwide distribution and basically as soon as the uh, token started coming off the, uh, the, the factory, the, uh, off the conveyor belt as it were, we, we started distributing. So we've not ramped up production to, to peak yet, but we've started distribution already on the 14th of September. Um, and we've concentrated on areas with a high proportion of elderly residents on the assumption um, that they are more likely to want the token rather than to use uh, the app. It's been very healthy. We've moved the, the distribution points to malls. Queues have been forming, safe distance queues. But, uh, but there is interest. There's interest. And I think um, uh, I've been asked in my capacity as a, as, a, as a constituency MP, people have sort of, you know, could you get me one quickly? I and mean, the answer is no, yeah, sorry. But, uh, but we will, though. We will make these tokens available to whoever um, in Singapore wants it. So it's, it's, it's going to be our means then of getting participation rate as high as possible. I suspect the eventual steady state will be a, a nice healthy balance between people who use the app and people who use the token. And you may find there's some movement between the two. Doesn't matter. Same software, same program, same outcome. Excellent. That's, that's brilliant. Um, and you know, just anecdotally from, I know from other countries where, where some of these contact tracing apps have been deployed, um, there are some data privacy concerns and, you know, personal data is being collected through the app. Uh, you know, which raises these concerns. How, how is Singapore balancing the public health security with privacy? And uh, would also love your thoughts if, if you had seen the, the context from other countries as well and maybe learn from them uh, while developing your system. Well, look, you know, in every issue of public health governance, I mean, public governance in general, but 
in a crisis in particular, there's always going to be a balance between uh, the individual privacy, privacy and the management of that situation for the public good. And, and this is no different. It's a, it's a public conversation that you have to have. It's, uh, there are elements about trust institutions, the social trust that people have in each other, and uh, the kind of governance that you uh, put in play over the program and the transparency that you that you demonstrate about how you do it and the data that's being collected. So you have to have some principles. Um, we have benefited from uh, a, a particular set of principles around data privacy and data security uh, that have been in place for some time, uh, governing both the, the public sector as well as the private sector. Uh, and so when we stood up this public health a response to the pandemic, to the crisis, using data collection. Uh, we had this framework to refer to, we, and we had to, uh, and we were able to sort of demonstrate how this program fits into that framework uh, and provides the same reassurance um, around that framework. So that, that's, the, that's the, the starting position, to have that public conversation uh, in terms of an engagement with the public so that people understand what it is we're doing and why it is we're doing it this way. But clearly, in something like this, that's not going to be enough. Uh, people worry about the technology being intrusive. Uh, people worry about being tracked. So we've done a few things. The first design decision actually was what you referenced earlier on in your question, which is to separate out the process into different aspects so mm -hmm. that you didn't have you know, um, one app to rule them all, you know, one program to gather all the data. And, and so you had safe entry location based, but it's location based around the institution, around the mall, around the market, around the shop, rather than location based around the person. Um, and then you have trace together, which is proximity based, but it's proximity based around the person. So splitting up the the programs and the process of collection and the technology uh, was, we thought, important in terms of driving trust as well. Um, second thing that we did is that when we developed the apps, uh, we made the uh, Trace Together app source code open source. So it's available for anybody around the world to, to, to sort of try to break and try to have a look at. And then people can reassure themselves that it doesn't collect GPS data. It doesn't have any live cellular connectivity. It's not feeding information back to any central database. You, 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 the user, have to make a positive decision once you have been diagnosed as being COVID-19 positive to upload your data. Um, so that's important. And, and the same is true for the hardware of the token. We brought some developers in and in a very public way. You said, you know, tear this down, have a look at it, and then write about it, blog about it. And they did. Uh, reassured themselves that again the token was basically it did exactly what it says on on the tin. Um, so that type of approach was important that people can can engage with the technology um, in a in a in a useful way to inform themselves. So the program as a whole, uh, data stays on either the app, your phone, or the token. It doesn't get uploaded live. Um, there are process controls about how consent is given and how the data is uploaded. There's also quite a lot of governance controls in the, within the public sector about who can access that data. And this is very much a public health response. And um, uh, it's about our public health professionals having access to the data. And, and then on the token itself, the data is deleted every 25 days. You've got a 25 day rolling um, uh, data storage. So it's not that months and months of uh, information is, is being tracked. So we've, um, we, we've put in place, I hope, uh, a comprehensive approach from the public conversation, access to the technology, a set of governance principles, which um, are, I hope robust, but also not peculiar and particular to this implementation so that people can take reference from what has happened before and think through what will happen in the future. But all of that, you know, we're, we, we still have to be very vigilant. Like any technology agency, we're, we're one data breach away from uh, having to rebuild public trust. So we're paying a lot of attention to this from a cybersecurity perspective, from a data security perspective, um, and, and we'll have to keep talking about it. That's uh, absolutely fascinating. And I have 20 more questions for you just on that. But uh, just no for problem. everybody, um, I'm just going to move on and, uh, and I would love to continue that um, in, a, in a separate thread. But uh, beyond COVID-19, Singapore has, uh, has been recognized as a leader in health tech. 
How has the government supported the private sector in fostering a welcoming environment to allow for these tech breakthroughs? As we know that you know technology and health are now uh, completely married, and, and would love to kind of just get your sense of uh, of how that works in your country. Well, um, again, a multi-pronged approach. Um, I would start by describing our. Uh, I was about to say aggressive, but perhaps that's the wrong, uh, the wrong descriptor to use. Our, our deeply held belief, our deep commitment to regulatory sandboxes, um, which we, we got very uh, proactive about in, uh, I think, about 2018, 2017, 2018. And this is not a health but peculiar to our health uh, in industry here in Singapore. It's across our public sector. But basically, we were quite clear that in a number of areas, technology was potentially outstripping uh, the regulatory governance frameworks that were in place for that industry. Uh, and so we, we set up a, a set of governance principles for regulatory sandboxes to identify innovative approaches, new business models, uh, uh, new modalities of transaction, and have a process where you have a, uh, a regulator, a policy owner that was willing to stand up this regulatory sandbox and engage with the private sector providers. Saying that clearly, they have, uh, they have a, a benefit and an advantage by uh, launching their products within a regulatory sandbox because part of that process would be to then influence and um, inform downstream the, the update to the regulatory landscape and the policy landscape. And the, the, sort of, the reason for it was because we had a, a lacuna, a gap, some kind of a lag in our policy and regulatory landscape. You have a new business model, a care model, uh, that you want to get going, launch it within this like regulatory sandbox, define parameters. Those parameters give you some sense of confidence around liability, gives the patients, the public, uh, some uh, confidence around safety. And then over the medium term, we all have some confidence that this will then result in better regulation and better policy. Um, so we've done the same. We had a specific program within healthcare. Uh, called the Licensing Experimentation and Adaptation Program, we, which conveniently becomes LEAP. Uh, we, we like our acronyms. Uh, and so that, that has allowed healthcare providers to uh, introduce new models of care, new models of transactions, um, evolve their, their current models to, 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 to adapt to the new uh, uh, regulatory environment. We, we've partnered that from the public sector side with uh, training. You, you have to make sure that uh, healthcare professionals then are up to speed, whether it's about telemedicine, uh, the use of technology to prioritize patient safety. Uh, all of these are things then that now have to become part of our, our training processes for, for healthcare professionals. So that's one, one, one aspect. Um, another aspect is just direct partnerships. Uh, we've um, tried to shift our focus away from uh, disease-specific interventions, uh, dealing with uh, decompensation, and move upstream towards health, towards fitness and wellness. And our, our Health Promotion Board, our, uh, one of our public health agencies, has had a direct collaboration with both Fitbit and Apple um, to think through how we might use their personal devices that, that both companies have um, uh, been successful at. Uh, the data that's gathered for individuals then to be fed back to that individuals to um, encourage them to take greater responsibility, but also a, a more interventionist approach around their own health. Um, and the government then has a role as a, essentially an honest broker, a, 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 a platform to allow these providers to come in and integrate both the software, their device, and third-party platforms into some of our public health initiatives. Um, and so we've, we've stood up public national public programs around these devices and these programs, step challenges, fitness challenges, uh, integrating a private sector hardware-based uh, approach, their software, integrating it with national uh, software platforms and national public health interventions. So that's a, that's a, a second limb of, of work, direct partnerships that uh, try to get things done. Um, and then um, thirdly, we can stand up institutions within the public sector that are specifically targeted towards this type of innovative approach with the private sector. Um, we've got a, a center for healthcare assistive and robotics technologies um, working through one of our economic agencies uh, so that we can uh, collaborate and study within the healthcare environment, uh, robotics uh, uh, technologies, assistive technologies, and essentially do so in a way that creates the, a physical environment 
and a direct link for uh, private providers to come in. Lastly, the, the, the fourth limb is funding. Um, as a country, we commit to spending about 1% of our GDP through uh, the public finances in R&D every year. I mean, this is, and then on top of that, clearly the private sector as well commits its own funding for R&D through. Uh, our, and so that 1% goes out through our National Research Foundation. And we've committed tranches of that to diagnostics development, uh, the uh, Health Technologies Consortium. Uh, all of this, like all uh, public funding, connects academics and industry partners with key challenges that we think are important uh, to our national uh, needs. And then we directly have uh, uh, funding, uh, not so much from a research perspective, but sort of capital in order to then think of transformation and scaling towards industry applications. So we've got Seeds Capital, which is the investment arm of our uh, Enterprise Singapore, one of our public agencies, as well as SG Innovate, which looks at deep tech. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a firm, a deep tech development firm, uh, under the purview of our National Research Foundation, not health specific, but clearly quite a lot of its work will apply to med tech startups as well. So I think that's the, the multi-pronged approach that we have to take. And in all of those, there isn't a, an either or. It's, a, it's not a zero sum game of pi public or private. Uh, there's an opportunity in each of those areas to think through what is the correct interface between the public sector and the private sector, driving innovation, leveraging on national platforms, um, and, and just moving the envelope, the edge of the envelope forward. That is excellent, sir. Um, and then there, there were two questions, but I'll try to my best to combine them here. Um, you mentioned robotics, and I, I believe in after working with a number of world governments, I don't think I've ever come across a health uh, uh, ministry or a you know, private sector arm that actually has a health and robotics uh, combined initiative. Um, would love for your thoughts and just to share with our audience a little bit more about the robotics and particular uh, attention towards spot, the canine uh, COVID mitigation uh, uh, dog that you have. Uh, and, and also, lastly, beyond spot, beyond the, 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 the great work you're, you're doing in robotics, Kind of just your thoughts on what are those tech breakthroughs that are on the cusp that are really exciting you right now? Well, yes, yeah, spot, Spot's interesting. Uh, it, it's actually developed by, by a U.S. company, Boston Dynamics. I mean, you, yep. I'm sure you've seen the YouTube oh, videos. Oh, yeah, held so. them in very high regard, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but what we've done is we've retrofitted with a software uh, stack, a robotic software stack that our engineers have developed uh, to customize it for our needs. We've it's an, it's an experiment. It, it, it gets quite a lot of news, and it's one of the ways in which we, we, we raise public awareness of the use of technology. It's not so much for health, but for uh, safe distancing measures and management of uh, public spaces. So that's where we were, we were trialing the use of SPOT, um, basically using uh, it for semi-autonomous operations in parks, where it both mapped out uh, the environment using some video analytics, as well as did, had some automatic or semi-automated uh, detection for people who are not uh, observing safe distancing, as well as providing uh, auditory warnings. <laughs> this robotic dog comes up, comes along and sort of, I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and I'm simplifying, but essentially, you know, can you step away from the, you know, <laughs> please, please maintain a meter distance between them. Um, but frankly, um, it's, uh, it's a small part of our effort. It was a trial. Uh, I think in terms of that type of effort, the key technology is actually the smartphone that sits in the pocket of our enforcement yeah. agencies, our officers that are on the ground. And the fact that we're able to put uh, information in their hand uh, and, and a resource. Uh, and it's the backbone of our government technology stack, our uh, cloud-based data architecture, uh, our sensor and data integration platform, all of which sits silently, but it means then that that, that official in their in their uniform, wearing their body camera to make sure that there is transparency about the interaction, has in their hand and in their phone information that tells them where they need to be, where they can be most effective. But also it allows them to basically bring to bear the entire technology augmented capability of the public sector across our nation uh, to that one person if necessary. And I think that's, it's, 
it's less exciting than the robotic dog. You know? <laughs> I know nobody gets excited about a, a public health official with a, with a smartphone, but I think the ability of what happens through that smartphone is, I hope, transformative to our public health response. But, you know, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll experiment with more robotics and more dogs if uh, it gets the job done. Um, your other question, uh, I, you were asking me about what, what else was exciting. Correct. Yes, sir. Um, or excites well, you the most. Yeah, uh, you know, I, yeah, it's a, it's a long list, but I'm going to try and pick a few ideas. Um, the issue with healthcare, and I think this is pertinent to the, the te technology application to healthcare, is that um, if you get the fundamentals right, uh, you, you don't need to do such radical surgery later on. Um, and uh, some of the fundamentals are health, um, wellness, population-wide initiatives, um, and they are increasingly informed through uh, the data analytics that we can apply, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning at, at large scale. Uh, and so the ability to think through how we do that um, is, I think, very exciting, that we can get really granular um, information out, make recommendations about you, the sugar-sweetened beverages, the amount of a reasonable amount of fat that you can eat. Uh, you know, you don't have to go and be a weekend warrior and kill yourself with triathlons and marathons in order to be fit. What, what is the a, a reasonable middle point that is easily accessible for vast swathes of our population and will really transform their health? Again, it's pedestrian, but the fact that we can have very clear data and about what interventions work and get people on board, actually, I think will significantly transform health. Uh, at the powerful. other end, at the other end, you know, we're we're doing uh, a fair amount of research um, that is coordinated across the world. Uh, so our our national supercomputing center, for example, um, is is integrating pharmacogenetic data across a variety of centers from uh, different continents. The fact that we have the computing ability to do that and the connectivity to be able to do that, I think, and the amount of data that we can process. Uh, means that we can transform uh, in almost near real time. And you think through how quickly we've gone from the first description of the virus to a, a, a number of vaccine candidates uh, for COVID-19. That speed uh, itself, that is a value chain of data processing, information sharing, um, uh, laboratories that have been stood up, some of which have been powered by ro robotic tools, and putting that all together means that you can really transform a whole civilizational response to a, to a new pandemic. Uh, that's, I think, quite hopeful. Uh, you marry that with some of our in-lab uh, manipulative techniques, whether they're around mRNA or the CRISPR technologies, it means then that coming up with solutions need to be less about a hit and miss, and try a thousand things. You can start getting right down on a molecular basis and trying to find out what's likely to work. Uh, for us. So lots of things to be excited about. Uh, I, I wish I could just give you one example, but as I said, the list is long. Uh, it's very inspiring and it gives, it renews my uh, hope for this world. And I know that uh, our participants are extremely grateful for your insight today. Um, sirs, personally, it's been a delight and honor to speak with you. And uh, on behalf of the entire Meridian International Center, uh, I hope to see you in Washington soon, but until then, uh, keep fighting the good fight and uh, know that we're an ally with you uh, in this fight as well. Thank you very much, and I really enjoyed the time with you, and I look forward to another opportunity in the future. Thank you, and I hope you have a great uh, conference. Thank you very much, sir. Peru, Mr. Minister, thank you so much for that discussion. And I'd like to thank our other speakers, uh, Dr. Betty Chiang and Megan Multeni, uh, for participating in today's summit. And of course, we want to thank Gilead for uh, their sponsorship and partnership. To all of our viewers out there, thank you for your interest in uh, global health and, and the intersection uh, of global health and diplomacy. Uh, we hope that you will check back uh, our website on Monday, where we will have all of our sessions available on demand. I know we had two other concurrent sessions taking place uh, while we were doing this one. So we wanted to make sure that, that everyone is able to see all of our content. 
Uh, we hope that everyone stays healthy and safe, and we really look forward to when we will be able to welcome you to Meridian's campus. Thank you so much.